All right. <clears throat> Well, welcome to the York County Writers Roundtable. Um, my name is Jamie Kinsley. Um, this is about an hour and a half long program sponsored by the York County History Center. We have a bunch of speakers today to talk about some amazing things that are happening around York County. Um, so the Writers Roundtable has been meeting for about five years. We meet quarterly every three months. And each time we talk about things that are happening with our local historians, writing projects, research, um, sharing different books that are coming out. And the whole point is to network and work together and find some um, camaraderie and some common grounds so we can help each other grow, share resources, and of course, learn from one another. Um, so I'd like to start with an update from Nicole Smith. Um, she is going to talk to us about the York County History Center. Hi, thanks, Jamie. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions during this presentation, please type them in the chat feature or in comments on Facebook. We'll be checking them and we'll try to address them all um, after the presentation. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube page. Um, all of our programs are being live streamed on Facebook as well. Uh, just a couple announcements from the History Center. We are planning to open uh, the History Center to the public on April 1st. Reservations will be required for the research library and the museums. Uh, we do also have a number of virtual programming uh, programs coming up this Sunday, March 7th at 2.30 uh, is the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogy Society. Uh, speaker will be David Carmichael, the State Archivist of Pennsylvania, speaking about the new archives building. Our second Saturday program is March 13th. And the topic is Hartley's Additional Continental Regiment presented by Mark Dubin. On March 17th for St. Patrick's Day, the Civil War Roundtable will have a presentation about the Irish Brigade by Chris Army and Rick Schroeder. Uh, for more information about any of these programs or to make reservations, please visit our website, which is yorkhistorycenter.org, or call the front desk. I also want to mention before I turn it back over to Jamie that we do have a new virtual exhibit that was just launched on the Underground Railroad that you can also see if you go to our YorkHistoryCenter.org website under museums. So thank you. All right, thank you, Nicole. Um, Jim, we've got some young guest speakers tonight. Yes, you know, uh, normally during the, civil, during the uh, York County um, you know, right after round table, we go around, literally go around the table and talk about projects. And we, this format doesn't allow that. So we brought in a couple uh, ringers here tonight to talk about projects, um, you know, that uh, really exciting projects that are coming up. And one of the things that they're going to talk about, they're going to talk about uh, uh, Facebook groups that started in the middle of uh, COVID. Uh, you know, uh, one, one thing that is obvious in Facebook, in the Facebook world is, that people are looking for programming, they're looking for information, content, they're looking for things to do, things to see once they can get out, uh, or things they can see during COVID that are where they could be isolated or, uh, you know, and, and safe. And uh, one of the ways to do that is through Facebook groups where, you know, uh, where you, you can learn, um, you know, from your home. And we have two examples of that tonight. Uh, and these, these Facebook, we have one, uh, Domi Miller will talk about um, her uh, Newburytown Facebook group, which really goes to a broader area than uh, Newburytown, which she'll explain to us. Uh, uh, but one of the things about both these Facebook groups, and Tristan will talk about the Redline group, uh, is that they are, uh, they're in, they, they feature engagement. It's one thing to grow numbers, and both of them in less than a year have, uh, are around 2,000, I think uh, Red Line's a little bit more than 2,000, and Newberry Town's a little bit less than 2,000 members. But you, to do that, you need the engagement, you need the likes and the comments and the shares, and both of these groups are expert at doing that. So we brought the moderators of those groups in so we can learn. And one thing that our museums aren't, aren't open uh, during this time frame, uh, but there is value in virtual visitors which is what both um, Newburytown and Redline have been able to gain. 
So uh, we're interested to see how they, they did it. And we'll start first with uh, uh, Dommy Miller. And I, are those, uh, what that background there, are those golf clubs back there? They are, yes. You? It's a set I of my this. brother's golf clubs. <laughs> oh, I wonder what the story there was. Um, you know, your, your group, uh, why don't you just go ahead and, and tell us about uh, your group. You're, you're a, a, a trained uh, librarian archivist, uh, master's in library science, which is a wonderful uh, background to have when you moderate a group or do history. So tell us about, tell us a little about yourself and tell us about how you've grown this group. Thanks, Jim. Well, I'm Dominish Miller. Um, for short, I go by Domi or Dom because Dominish can be a mouthful. Um, like you said, I am a trained archivist and librarian. I have a master's degree in library science from Clarion University, go Golden Eagles. And my concentration is in local history and archiving. Um, during the day, I work for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in Harrisburg as a law librarian. Um, I've been working from home pretty much since May, I believe it was May 12th, so it's almost been a full year that I've been working from home. And in July, I decided to start the group Preserving the History of Newburytown on Facebook. Um, it was really just supposed to be a hobby. I love local history. My grandfather, Claire Gross, lived right across from the Newberry Elementary School. His home belonged to his parents before him. He lived there his whole life. And when he passed away in 2009, I inherited a ton of family photos, documents. I have their World War II ration booklets. Basically, you name it and they saved it. And that really sparked my interest in local and family history. Um, Newburytown, if you've ever been there, super small. Um, it's between Harrisburg and York. I always, when people ask me where I'm from, I never say Newburytown. I just say between Harrisburg and York because it's a really good place um, to center yourself. And my group focuses on preserving the history of Newburytown. Like I said, it was supposed to be a hobby. I started it in July and we're almost at 1700 uh, members right now, which that's more people than there are in Newburytown. So I think that's fantastic. And the great thing about it has been that I haven't limited myself to just Newburytown, because if you're familiar with the area, you know that Edders is in Newburytown technically, um, Goldsboro, Yoakum Town, Lewisbury, Cly, we're all really intermingled. And then you throw in Redland, which isn't really a place, um, but we have a high school with a Lewisbury address there. We had the Little League team that made it all the way to the Little League finals. So, you know, I wanted the whole community to be involved. And I started by posting my own family photos that I had from my grandfather and it really sparked interest. I think during COVID, there's this need for nostalgia. People are at home. They're not necessarily getting to see their grandparents or their older family members because they don't want to get them sick. So they're at home. They're looking through those old family photo albums and they're coming up with the questions that they want to ask the older generations before they're gone. So this has been a great place for us to share those things. Um, every once in a while, I'll post, you know, where did you graduate from high school and tell me what class? Uh, apparently, the people at Redna Redland really think that uh, the class of 1985 was the best class, so that sparked a discussion. Um, there was just a discussion on do you still can food and make your own jellies, make your own applesauce. Um, people love to share their family recipes. They're excited to say that their grandma made the best boss knots. Um, no, their grandma has the best cookie recipe. So I think when you're going to start a history group on Facebook, start it as a group, don't start it as a page because a group allows more interaction between the members. They can post things and the moderator can keep an eye, make sure that it's relevant. Um, but with a page, it's really just the moderator that's posting. So with a group, there's more interaction. Um, and then, you know, just ask the people in your community what they wanna talk about. The major thing that I've found with Newberry Town is if you can find that you're related to someone in town, that will spark a huge discussion because we always joke that everyone's related to each other. The joke in high school was be careful who you date because it's probably your cousin. And it's sort of true. Um, you know, you can't go to a picnic or a festival or a flea market at church without running into someone that you know or someone that you're related to. So, you know, it's great when I post a family photo and someone says, oh, is that your grandma? Um, I think that my mom was her cousin. And then it starts a whole discussion. More people will jump onto the comment section and say, oh yeah, well, did you know that we're related this way? And then they're sharing more photos. 
So it's been really great. I haven't even really had to ask for content. People are just giving it to me, which has been the greatest thing because I don't want to force the conversation. I really want it to flow naturally. And because I just started it as a hobby and really genuinely just wanted it to be a way to preserve our local history for the next generation, I think people feel comfortable sharing those things with me. I don't have an ulterior motive. They know I'm not trying to make money off of it. It's really just something that I'm passionate about. So when you're genuine and you care about the content and you you know, personally are willing to share your own story, people will be more willing to open up to you, which I think is really important, especially on Facebook. You know, It's a way for people to share family photos if you live across the country. It's a way to keep in touch with grandparents, share pictures of your grandkids. So you, know, you really wanna keep your group focused on family, um, local families, local people, local landmarks. So that's been really important to me for growing the group is just really focusing on the reason that I started it and just growing it to include more people because you know everyone that's joined has really genuinely been interested in saving their family history for the next generations of their own family. So that's been a really great thing about it. Um, but you know, any advice that I have for people that want to start their own group, just go for it. You know, know what you want to talk about. Um, throw out some discussion questions and then just wait and see what people say because honestly with people hold up at home right now it's not going to be hard to get people to want to comment to want to share pictures to want to talk about different things on your forum I mean uh, you just had an event do you want to talk about that a little bit I did yeah um, now that things are getting a little nicer uh, outside and people were finally getting vaccinated, we were able to have our first in-person meeting for the group. Um, I had about 12 people show up to the Yoakumtown Church of God. We were socially distanced and wore masks, but everyone came with their own family photo albums. They had books about the history of Newberrytown and the history of York. And all I had to say was, hi, welcome to the meeting. And it just got going. Someone was like, okay, we're gonna introduce ourselves. And all of a sudden I had everyone's family history. I think out of the 12 people, six people were related. Um, they found out that they were cousins. Everyone was talking about the farms that they grew up on and um, you know the events that they used to go to in town and how much they miss those old style picnics that the church used to put on and you know it was really great and everyone just had questions about how they could continue their research we were talking about databases we were talking about even you know going down to the york history center to use their archives um, online resources physical resources so it was really great to finally meet some of the members in person and get that interaction and, you know, they were so thankful that I started the group because they said, you know, they have these things at their house, they have these photo albums, they have these family histories that they've compiled, but they want to share it with other people and they want to get more information through other people in the group that might be related to them, but they just don't know them in person. So getting to meet them through the group is really facilitating the sharing of the information in the community. So that's been really helpful as well. You know, one thing you mentioned, and you, you mentioned it quickly, but it was really a, a key point here is, is the difference between a page and a group. Some, um, some organizations will kind of need to uh, go to a page. Groups, uh, de definitely, that's, that's kind of a vertical relationship, whereas groups are, are more horizontal. They're member-driven versus the organization-driven. Uh, is there anything else to say about that, Tommy? Um, I've just found with the group, that it really facilitates the conversation and I'm not always the person posting the content or starting the conversation. Um, a lot of the times I'll go to sleep and I'll wake up in the morning and a whole discussion has happened on the group without me. Um, a lot of people, I've asked them just what do you want to see on the group and they'll express that, you know, they want more um, land ownership maps. So someone will see that and in the evening, they'll just go out on the internet, they'll uh, do their own research and they've posted answers to that person's question and I don't even have to be the one to do it. And you're not gonna find that on just a page um, because the moderator is the one that really has to facilit facilitate the content and post the things. Where in the group, it's really member driven and the members, as long as they're posting things that are respectful and um, relevant to the group, they can really just keep posting things and I can just sit back and if I have something to say about it, I can comment and if not, I mean, I'm learning things because I'm only 26 years old and a lot of our members are in the um, 
45 plus age group. So, you know, they've been around a lot longer than I have, and they have that firsthand experience and life experience. So they're teaching me about things in the community that I never even knew about. So having the opportunity for them to drive the conversation in the group, as opposed to me having to continuously post things to keep the conversation going has been really helpful to the growth of the group. Great. Well, thank you, Domi. Appreciate uh, you filling us in on that. And now we're moving to the Redline group and we have Tom Steele looks like via phone maybe. Uh, and we have uh, Tristan Mundus. Uh, and Tristan, that's a, one of the most interesting backgrounds I've ever seen in, a, in one of these Zoom. What, and it's a real background, right? That's not made up. That's not one of these fake Correct. ones. Correct. Yeah, that's that's a real background. Everything's right here. <laughs> and um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Tristan and uh, Tom are both um, you know, they're collectors, obviously, uh, but but they're also and they're, they're they're knowledgeable about rails, you know, uh, trolleys and and railroad, uh, which is important in the red line area uh, because they they you all had both there. Um, uh, but you're engaged in the community and uh, in a big way. And that, I think that helped spark your group. Uh, so, uh, and, and yes, uh, I, I think probably people have noticed that Tristan, you're probably, I know you're still a teenager. I, I knew you since you're 16. And uh, so, you know, obviously wise beyond your years, knowledgeable beyond your years, um, you know, here in the red line area. So why don't you go ahead and take it, take it away and tell us how you've, uh, you've grown this group in the, in the middle of a pandemic. Well, it usually started out, you know, a lot of these groups are starting out, especially in New York County community. And they'll start out, you know, some of them fizzle off and other ones take off kind of like the retro New York Facebook group. Um, after the pandemic began, the red line train station closed down. We didn't have any meetings. No, no new information was really kind of coming out. And I decided, well, maybe it'd be good to have the information out to the public. And Tom Steele mentioned to me, he said, hey, he goes, I'd like to make some sort of group, you know, that has to do with Redline. And originally we were going to make it, you know, just to like share items and stuff. And I kind of mentioned, I said, hey, I said, I think it'd be a great idea if we just narrow it down to the, the actual items itself. And when you show those items themselves, it really gets it out to everybody that can see it. And I said, well, if we name it the Red Line History and Preservation, then everybody can share and everybody can bring a topic up that, you know, anybody would like to share. And what really happened was I thought it was going to be two to 300 members originally, because with Red Line being a very small town, I thought, well, two to 300 people in the group, that would be, that'd be quite a bit of people. But after I'd say about May and June, it's really started to pick up. Um, we were rated about four to 500 members and I was discussing back and forth with Tom saying, hey, like this has really taken off, you know, and the members started really participating then because at first, you know, I shared a few photos, Tom shared a few photos, we shared some information, you know, back and forth. And then some of the members really started picking up on it. And then I was noticing in other groups that our group was being shared to those groups. And especially with Retro York, that really helped out pull the group in. And the group started kind of taking off, you know, right around the summer months. So around October, November, we, we crossed a thousand members, which I never would have thought of happening. And some of the members we saw in there, there I mean, these are big names from Redline. A lot of the people that had to do with the cigar industry, the sports, the sports playing through the high school. Um, even some people in our borough office, you know, that are, you know, act very active in the community that you haven't heard before, you know, but they have a huge part in the community. And this is, was one great way for everybody to share that information. Um, right where we're sitting now, we're sitting at 2,300 members. Me and Tom are the only admins. I think it would be good to add another admin or two onto the page because we're starting to get quite a few members. And there's a lot of posts that come in that are just, you know, we have to moderate, you know, pick and choose what belongs on the page. And we really try to keep it to Redline itself. You know, we'll branch out to Windsor, Friesville, and Adamsville. But we really don't like to go through the whole county since the Retro York Facebook page is there for that. Um, a few other things that we've noticed is the members themselves really are engaged in sharing with um, just family lineage is one big thing. Um, like Dami was saying earlier, 
like if somebody posts a picture of their family farm on there at least 30 or 40 people will comment back on that individual picture with some sort of information leading up to that topic and it's really neat to to see families get reconnected there's a lot of family members that haven't seen each other in 20 30 maybe 40 plus years and now they're realizing wow these people are you know still out there even though they're both on facebook the group has really brought all those people together great uh, tom do you have anything uh, i don't know if you can hear Yeah, well, I, I have, have long felt like uh, the red line area is probably the most engaged area in the county, one of the most, at least, if not the most engaged areas of the history in terms of their, uh, in terms of their history. And uh, so you all have hit a, a really a, a sweet seam there. Um, and uh, I, I would just uh, point out that, uh, you know, you came, you saw a need and you, and you delivered by forming the group after the museum closed. And I, I like the idea that you mentioned that, um, you know, th these groups aren't in competition with each other. You know, they're all had the same idea The uh, you know, is, is you're, you're trying to engage the community in their, in their history, the bigger community and the smaller communities with their history and form a, a kind of a community, uh, in, enhance the community memory. So that is, um, and you're doing that, both of you all are doing that. And so I uh, just wanted to, point that out here tonight. Do, uh, Tristan, anything else you have? Um, anything else to, to comment on? Well, uh, one thing group? I would say is if, you know, anybody that really knows the Red Line area, well, knows it's, it's an extremely rich in history area with cigars, furniture, and everything manufacturing wise, it's a huge area for that. And what I realized also is I was going down through in like the settings area of the group, just, you know, adventuring around to look at our group. Um, I'm going around and I'm looking at like where these members are from and there's people that have joined the group that are out of the country, Alaska, Nevada, North Dakota, South Dakota, but they had some kind of red line and it's great that this history is able to be pushed out across the nation and even out of the country itself. There's people from, there's people in Jamaica, there's a cup, there's two or three members that are in Africa now, but they had some kind of red line at one point. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really neat thing. So thank you all so much. And uh, we'll go ahead now with uh, uh, Tom Davidson, uh, Jamie. Awesome, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so we're gonna get started now with uh, Tom Davidson. He's gonna talk about Lincoln Highway and its history. So he's been doing this research for over 20 years. He is the expert. He will have a fabulous presentation. And then after he presents, he will be taking questions. Um, so he used to be a board member on the Lincoln Highway Heritage Corridor. And currently he is still a volunteer for the PA chapter of the Lincoln Highway Association. So he is going to be sharing a PowerPoint. Um, it will share on your screen. If you have any questions along the way, you can put it in the chat box down at the bottom or like I said, we can save it to the end when we go ever through everything together. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much. Let me pull up my uh, presentation here and just like to thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, I have my Lincoln Highway emblem cap. I'll take that off so you can see me a little better. Also have on my comfortable t-shirt that says I'm not old, I'm a classic in relation to the antique automobiles that we're going to be uh, talking about that traveled along the Lincoln Highway. And um, I, think, I think it was Jim McClure that once introduced me as a student of Lincoln Highway history. And that's certainly correct in that I do not have a degree in history uh, I am not um, trained as a writer. Um, my undergraduate degrees in mathematics, I have a master's in legal studies, but uh, I just want to encourage everyone tonight, um, you know, we're at the writer's table to gain inspiration to write about what we're interested in. And uh, so I just wanted to encourage you with that tonight and thank you to the York County History Center uh, for making this possible. Um, I'm gonna mention some things throughout the presentation. 
probably obvious to you, but hopefully you can apply them to your interests, whether it's the Lincoln Highway or some other topic uh, that you have. But first, you know, um, just explore other writers that are right about, um, in my case, Lincoln Highway in Pennsylvania. Um, Brian uh, Bucco is um, director of publications at the Heinz History Center. But many years ago, he wrote um, a marvelous um, history of the Lincoln Highway across the state of Pennsylvania. This second edition that you see the cover of here, it's almost 20 years since it's been published and the Lincoln Highway has changed a lot since then. Um, but, but just, um, you know, look for the people that are writing about your topic of interest. On the right, I have an example of a blog post uh, from a uh, local historian, uh, Stephen H. Smith, and really a love of how he goes in depth about the different places along the Lincoln Highway. And I would just encourage you and to check out his blog post. Um, one thing I would say is, as you um, become familiar with these writers, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to them and just start a discussion. I I can't thank um, these two gentlemen enough for um, you know. I'll ask them a question, and a lot of times the way I was looking at some you know some piece of information they will add to it, they will share. And um, just something to um, think about in terms of um, looking beyond um, maybe just uh, one set of archives of historical documents. Um, Lincoln Highway was America's first coast to coast improved road for automobiles. And um, many people don't realize it, it was uh, really uh, America's Main Street from New York City to San Francisco. It was established in 1913 uh, by the route was established by the Lincoln Highway Association. One of the founders was Carl Fisher. Um, you know, he also formed um, the Indianapolis Speedway, the development of Miami Beach. And, you know, just as you're uh, thinking about uh, early 20th century transportation. Basically, the automobile was invented, manufactured, and people needed a place to go. And the Lincoln Highway became one of these named trails early in the 20th century, and it remains one of the most famous. Um, you know, many people will refer to um, Route 66 as the mother road. Um, and myself and many others consider um, the Lincoln Highway as the father road, you know, even before Route 66 um, was the Lincoln Highway. So they established this route on a network of existing roads. And one of my favorite quotes from Carl Fisher, Fisher is, let's build it before we're too old to enjoy it. And, um, you know, to me that in cap it yeah, captures the uh, spirit of the Lincoln Highway. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk a whole lot about um, the road networks uh, before the Lincoln Highway, but I did want to mention that um, in uh, the 1700s into the 1800s, um, Pennsylvania established a network of private roads, turnpikes. They were chartered by the state. They were primarily funded and built by uh, private companies. And it, uh, as you look at this map, I wanted you to notice a couple things. One is um, all the purple that's running from um, uh, the northeast um, corner of the map of Pennsylvania down to uh, central Pennsylvania. And those represent the different mountain ranges that people th that were traveling across the state would come across. So um, on the right, we have uh, the first turnpike, the Philadelphia and Lancaster turnpike. Um, when it was built, it was the best road in the country. 
A few years later, it was extended to Columbia and the Susquehanna River. And the state then began looking west, if you look at the green line on the map, and um, a series of turnpikes were chartered and authorized to be built between uh, Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. You know, you have to think about, um, you know, after Revolutionary War, these turnpikes were built pretty much on existing routes, but um, they were improved. And again, um, the reason they were improved for was for uh, commerce to move goods and people across the state. And before this, if you look at Western Pennsylvania, um, you had primarily military roads. You had Braddock's Road, you had Forbes Road um, through uh, central Pennsylvania, and they were both headed to, to Pittsburgh um, to take back uh, Fort Duquesne. But after the wars, you had this network of private turnpikes. Um, beyond the two I've mentioned, you had turnpikes added from um, Chambersburg to Gettysburg, from Susquehanna to York. And it's, it's kind of interesting, but the last part of this turnpike that was built was uh, the York and Gettysburg Turnpike, uh, which you see in the middle in 1818, um, the gold, the short gold section there. And you have to wonder, you know, well, why was that done last? Why was that piece done last? And I think in part it was because of uh, the economics of it and also the fact that, um, you know, York is focused a lot more towards Baltimore towards uh, south, the southern port, as opposed to east of the Susquehanna, they, they were, um, they were uh, looking towards Philadelphia to move their goods and services. Here in York, um, the turnpikes pretty much followed uh, what was known as uh, the Great Wagon Road. And initially that went from Wrightsville, York, and then took a sharp turn south. So, you know, why, why did that happen early on? Because of the topography, you know, people were traveling in the, didn't want to go across the mountains. Um, I've listed here some of the other turnpikes I talked about. In York County, the two primary turnpikes in 1805, we have the Susquehanna and York Borough Turnpike. And then finally in 1819, York and Gettysburg Turnpike. So the Lincoln Highway followed these existing roads and um, they're still there today. And I think one of the challenges for people to recognize the historic nature of the road is uh, the fact that they travel on this road every day. You know, in Wrightsville, it would be along Hellam Street. Hellam Township, it's, it is known as the Lincoln Way. Hellam Borough, it's called Market Street. And then East York through York City, East Market Street, West York, West Market Street. And then further points west, it's called Lincoln Way again. So um, people are um, traveling these roads every day and they don't even recognize um, the history of the roads they're on. I wanted to talk very briefly about uh, the company that um, my son and I established, uh, Lincoln Highway Heritage. And we want to promote America's uh, first coast to coast Main Street. Um, and we're focusing here in York County along uh, the route I just mentioned from Wrightsville um, through West York. Uh, on what has become known as Pennsylvania 462. But then west, further west, it, it does follow US 30 west to Abbottstown. Um, some people will say, well, the Lincoln Highway is US 30. Well, a lot of what the original route of the Lincoln Highway did become US 30, you know, this stretch from Wrightsville to West York, PA 462, originally was US 30, but you know, the, the Lincoln Highway didn't move north of the city when they modernized US 30 and kept building there, uh, in my opinion. 
maybe we could call that an alternative route. Um, I think of the Lincoln Highway as a ribbon connecting all the communities east to west across York County. So, you know, what can we do to try to um, connect these communities and their transportation history? Be talking a little more about it, but we're working on installing signs along the road so people can see that they're on a historic road. Um, I've done some work with um, PennDOT on some projects um, to try to ensure that they continue to recognize the history of the road. Uh, one is the Memorial Bridge um, between Wrightsville and Columbia. Um, that's going to be uh, restored. Um, another is um, the I-83 project at um, exit 19. Um, the Lincoln Highway goes right under the interstate there. And in some ways that um, passage acts as a, um, as a kind of gateway to between Eastern York and York City. So what can we do there to uh, remember the Lincoln Highway history? I want to partner with some uh, businesses along the road to uh, promote some heritage tourism initiatives. And uh, the last thing I'll talk a little more about is what about the buildings along the road from that era, whether they be service stations, uh, diners, um, motels from the era, how do we reuse those buildings and yet protect them? I wanna talk a little bit about how the National Good Roads Movement impacted York. This is a picture of um, an automobile endurance race from 1909. And if you're familiar with the scene, that is um, the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge uh, from the Wrightsville side, uh, looking back over the Susquehanna River. So um, in the early 20th century, um, to promote your automobiles, it was all about uh, speed and endurance. Uh, these people were going from New York City to Seattle and their destination was the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And those kind of involved in what we know as world fairs. But, you know, they were traveling cross country um, for a prize. And uh, interestingly enough, with all these powerful vehicles you see here, the winner of this race was actually a Ford Model T that was stripped down and made it in 23 days to go from New York coast to coast, but um, they were disqualified because they had to replace an engine along the way. So, you know, if you look at the York automobile industry, whether it be Pullman or other manufacturers in the early 20th century, a lot of their promotion of their vehicles uh, were to um, prove, you know, they could win races, they could go fast, but they could also uh, endure going over these roads that were in very bad conditions. Anita, Anita King, um, she was a silent film actress it also became the first woman uh, to drive solo across the United States. And I had the opportunity to write about her in the Lincoln Highway uh, Forum. Um, and uh, she was interesting in that she was from the Midwest, went to Los Angeles, and she became known as um, a female race car driver and stunt driver for the movies. Eventually she was given some acting roles and her opportunity came about here because she had made a wager uh, with the uh, executives from the newly formed uh, Paramount uh, movie theater that she could drive by herself from coast to coast. And, um, you know, she, she, interesting, she headed out from LA to San Francisco in 1915 and actually at the time set a, a land speed record for, for that trip between those two cities. And, and then um, 
she was uh, paramount, uh, gave her the title, the paramount girl. Uh, she was given a Kissel car uh, with Firestone tires. And she, she uh, left San Francisco from another exposition, the Panama Pacific International Exposition. And this is a picture of her in October um, in front of uh, the Princess Theater in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, by October, she had made it that far. And all, all along the way, she would give talks in the local Paramount theaters. Um, she was um, mobbed everywhere she went as a hero uh, for making this trip on her own. And uh, she even made it to York on um, October 15th uh, to the York Hippodrome Theater. And, you know, she had uh, some interesting things to say about her trip. She had backtracked from um, Lancaster over to York. She says, um, I was never called upon to pay toll on a road until I reached this part of Pennsylvania, except to cross the bridge over the Mississippi River. There seems like there's a toll gate every mile on these roads, and they charge so much too, particularly to cross the bridge over the Susquehanna. I never heard of such a thing before. So again, that was the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge that she was talking about. A few days later, she arrived in New York City and she was welcomed and celebrated for her accomplishments. I wanted to talk now about some, some um, of the local uh, history for the Good Roads Movement in York County. On the right is a familiar building in East York. It, it um, initially uh, housed uh, the York Motor Club and the York Motor Club um, merged into the White Rose Motor Club, which uh, became part of the Pennsylvania Motor Federation and AAA, the American Automobile Association. So some of uh, the earliest um, auto enthusiasts gathered together at this club along the Lincoln Highway uh, there in the historic district in East York. And thankfully, uh, this this beautiful building is uh, still still there today. On the left is a gentleman that not too many people are familiar with. And I, I found his picture um, in uh, actually the Lincoln Highway Association archives, which are at the University of Michigan. And his name is Eugene Francis Weiser. And um, the Weiser family came to York around 1795. Uh, his ancestor um, had uh, a hat making business along Market Street. And then other family members started um, in the lumber business, in the cigar box making business. They were bankers. They were board members on the Turnpike um, board of directors for the Port Turnpike companies. Um, his uncle um, lived in a house in York that became the site of the Yorktown Hotel. And he's also known as uh, the person that built Bloomingdale's um, out there in uh, Spring and Sperry Township along the Lincoln Highway. So um, Eugene Weiser, he went on, uh, initially he did different jobs. He sold insurance. He, um, I think he sold uh, pianos for a while uh, for, for your company. And um, he eventually became um, the first secretary of the York Chamber of Commerce. Prior to this, he was the secretary for the um, York Merchants Associations, which then became um, the chamber, local chamber of commerce. But he also had the unique position of, uh, he was the first local consul for the National Lincoln Highway Association. 
So to give you a little bit of a sense of how much of a road enthusiast he was, um, in 1911, he had um, the um, first license plate issued to anyone in York County. I could uh, imagine he may have gone up to Harrisburg and uh, stood in line to get that. Um, this familiar mural, murals of York, um, there's been some recent um, social media posts on this trip, but the York Chamber sent uh, Eugene Weiser, two other people uh, up through cities of the Northeast to post signs, to promote businesses to come to York to set up their manufacturing facilities. Um, so, you know, he was very much familiar with using um, the highways to promote businesses. Um, recently, I was uh, permitted to uh, review uh, the early archives of the York Chamber of Commerce. And um, to me, the amazing thing was just seeing, you know, how Eugene Weiser had handwritten all the minutes to all the committee meetings, all the business of the York Chamber, and it was all in his handwriting. Um, when he left the chamber, he became treasurer of Grant Warner Manufacturing in York. And, um, you know, that company was uh, certainly involved. They built um, heavy vehicle axles and they were certainly involved in the York plan. Um, Eugene Weiser um, was married and um, later in life moved out to a home um, along the Lincoln Highway there in East York. Uh, unfortunately, the home is no longer standing. It's, it's the property that now um, uh, Verizon has, um, has a facility there along Lincoln Highway, but, um, you know, he, he grew up in York City and, um, and then uh, ended his life many years later along the Lincoln Highway. Um, I am thankful um, that um, later this year, um, an article about uh, Eugene Weiser will be published in the Journal of York County Heritage. So again, that's an advantage of being a member of uh, York County History Center is receiving that publication. Just wanna go on real quickly and talk about the way the local business leaders promoted good roads, including the Lincoln Highway um, you know, if you think back to the private toll companies, they were primarily fun funded by the local merchants, the businessmen that needed good roads so that they could move their goods and people between cities. Um, you want to see what the roads were like back then? There's a great display in the um, York Industrial an agricultural museum there downstairs, how they constructed the roads. These weren't paved roads. These were roads made with, you know, stone and gravel. Um, many of them, even into uh, the early 1900s, even the major roads were dirt roads until the states took them over and started to improve them uh, in the early 1900s. But uh, the York Chamber, under uh, Eugene Weiser's leadership, or they were very instrumental in ensuring the Lincoln Highway, the original route, stayed through South Central Pennsylvania, because it wasn't a, even a year after um, this route was designated that people in other cities in Baltimore and Washington wanted the route changed so that it would uh, go through their cities and then back up to Gettysburg. Uh, but um, thankfully, through the efforts of the chamber and uh, local uh, Lincoln Highway uh, consuls, such as Eugene uh, Weiser, um, we were able to keep that here in York County. 
they went out and they painted Lincoln Highway uh, emblems on the telephone poles. Um, Mr. Weiser went and made speeches uh, from Lancaster to Chambersburg. And again, they were able to rally and uh, convince the Lincoln Highway Association that um, the original route, the most direct route, was the best road for the Lincoln Highway. Um, the chamber also ensured that these private toll roads we've been talking about, that they became public roads um, when the state uh, was finally convinced to take them over. Typically, uh, what this involved were many meetings between um, state officials, uh, county officials, because when these private roads were bought by, back, typically half of it was funded through the state and half of it was funded through the county. And it was a struggle. The York Chamber um, actually took um, these toll companies to uh, court, um, threatening to have these roads condemned. And, um, you know, they had to convince both state and uh, local officials, county officials, that this would be good for the county. Um, Mr. Weiser actually was asked to be a leader, president of an organization formed known as the Free Highway League. And the chamber board said he could participate, but they didn't want him to lead it because they were afraid of um, how much time that would take, but they were successful. And the Pennsylvania um, Highway Department took, took over these roads, they began maintaining them, they began improving them. And, um, you know, the debates even to this day about how we can pay for the good roads that we need uh, to transport goods for people to travel, we're still debating that today. Um, right after they um, were able to convince um, the state to take over the highways, York and Lancaster officials came together and said, we need a, a bridge across the Susquehanna dedicated to automobile traffic. In 1920, they tried uh, in the, uh, to get the state and the federal government to pay for it. That didn't happen. And it, it wasn't until 10 years later, after a lot of effort, that uh, York County and Lancaster County finally came together and they got the um, authority from uh, state and federal officials to build what is now uh, the Veterans Memorial Bridge uh, between uh, Columbia and Wrightsville. Um, that was finally dedicated in 1930. It's 90 years old now. And um, thankfully, it's, it's going to be restored here uh, in the coming years. But at the time, it was uh, an engineering marvel and the longest um, concrete arch bridge uh, in the world at the time. And it's, it's still a, a, a significant Lincoln Highway landmark that, you know, that we celebrate today. It was um, let me go on from now, but uh, something we need to uh, remember. Um, the Lincoln Highway Association does have an online map uh, that you can um, look at points of interest. You could um, pull up uh, electrical uh, vehicle charging stations. This top line is the Lincoln Highway, and then this lighter purple uh, route is this, um, it was called a feeder route uh, that uh, the Lincoln Highway Association set up um, to appease um, everyone down south to Washington, but, and then back up to Gettysburg, but it was not as uh, well known or traveled as the original Lincoln Highway route through York County. I want to talk real briefly about how 
having the Lincoln Highway, this transcontinental highway going across our county impacted us. Obviously, people traveling along the highway needed places to stay. Need to consider that in 1913, when the Lincoln Highway was established, the state speed limit was only 25 miles an hour. And people could not get as far as they can today on the road. Uh, so, you know, initially people would just camp along the road. Um, some people might be familiar with uh, Dr. Crandall's uh, health school, also before that known as the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Sanatorium and Grounds. People would just pull off the road there and camp. This here's an example. Um, Vogel Sanger's Cabins, it's still there today. It's now known as Schaff's Motel, just east of Wrightsville. But these tourist cabins would be built um, along the highway. Um, then eventually, you know, the, the motels along the road that we're familiar with. Also cropped up along the way to um, Greet the tourists for places like the Brookleaf Love Nest, the tree house that people came and they stayed in. And, you know, these were unique attractions built along the highway so that people would pull over and hopefully spend some of their money and uh, spend some time. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of storytelling. And this story comes from the village of farmers in Paradise Township. Um, the gentleman you see here is Dean Benzel. And, you know, really this story is what inspired me to write my first article for the Lincoln Highway Journal. And his farm as you're heading west of town is, um, right there is the Lincoln Highway Cattle Equipment Company. And on the left is an aerial uh, map from 1938. And you can see here um, on, on the bottom, on the left, how the original Lincoln Highway went right between the farmhouse and the barn. This was actually um, a a toll, there was a toll you paid here. This intersects with Lake Road. But you can see in 1938 that the original road was still there. On this upper arc is um, the new US 30 that was built. You know, over the years, the state kept um, smoothing out and widening uh, the Lincoln Highway. And um, this is an example, uh, as um, Mr. Betzels uh, shared with me, um, where Pendon initially wanted to go right between his house and, um, and the barn, and the family wouldn't allow it. And I guess then, you know, eminent domain wasn't as strong as it is now. And, you know, the state blinked and they built US 30 north of his house instead of in between and divide his farm. Over time, this original road has disappeared, but uh, the family has, uh, at the end of their driveway, they've installed one of these original Lincoln Highway uh, markers uh, from 1928. And um, that was an original location of one of the 1928 markers. So, you know, as you travel the Lincoln Highway, just remember, it's not just US 30 because a lot of the original alignments were still there. Um, you know, talking about storytelling, we're hearing a lot uh, recently uh, about uh, the Green Book. And one of uh, the places featured in an exhibit um, on this is the Yorktown. And again, the Yorktown is uh, was built by the community for uh, people that were traveling, primarily along the Lincoln Highway. It was built in 1925, and it's going to reopen, and it's, you know, going to be beautifully restored. And it's a reminder of how the community came together to provide something 
that was needed by travelers. Um, before this, the main hotel uh, along Lincoln Highway was a colonial hotel. Um, but, you know, by, by uh, 1920s, it was evident that we needed something better. Otherwise, people would either go around us or um, head on to uh, the next town, either, you know, Gettysburg to the west or um, to the east, Lancaster. You know, when I think of the Green Book, I, I think again of um, the fact that not everybody that traveled the Lincoln Highway um, had the same opportunities and accommodations. And, you know, um, the Green Book represented um, the ability for um, freedom to travel. And um, that is something that I think more and more is being picked up through through stories. Um, very quickly, I want to move on to um, an example of, uh, you know, legends versus history. I think whenever I say the Lincoln Highway, everyone wants to talk about the wonderful Lincoln Highway garage. And it was established in 1921. And on the left is an early picture. You can see the uh, gas pumps there as you um, pulled over to the station. And on the right is a mural uh, that's on the Turkey Hill that's now, now on that location. Um, you know, before these um, service stations came about, um, people would get gas just curbside in front of hardware store, a general store, whoever wanted to sell gas to them. Um, but um, what was reported about the Lincoln Highway garage was it was the first service station between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh where you could pull off of the road and fill up your tank. Um, you know, one question people ask about the Lincoln Highway garage is which Lincoln Highway garage? Um, you know, Mr. Smith again has written some, some great blog posts about in Wrightsville, there was a Lincoln Highway garage that was torn down when they built the Memorial Bridge. Uh, Hallam Borough, there's a Lincoln Highway garage, that property still standing. Um, in York, there was actually a Lincoln Way garage that later became an electronics store owned by uh, a Minick. And uh, so there were multiple Lincoln Highway garages that they were all uh, given that name to try to pull in um, cross country travelers. But um, one of the interesting things I found in New York um, County History Center archives, they have um, some building permits and on the top, you can see on 617, 1919, at the corner of Market and West Street, the Gulf Refining Company applied for a permit to build a service station. Um, Gulf Refining Company was based in Pittsburgh, one of the larger uh, companies at the time. They came into town and the, their, the way they picked their location, they actually uh, bought the mayor's house and uh, said they were going to spend $10,000 to build a service station um, for, the, for travelers and the city. A little uh, down a little further on September of 1918 on the southwest corner of Market and Fulton Streets, just a few blocks up from the History Center, the National Independent Oil Company uh, asked for a permit to spend $15,000 um, to build a service station. You might know um, that company more as offering uh, Nicoline, Nicoline uh, gasoline and oils. Um, they were a distributor uh, at the time. They were at that location for many years. Um, that site is now a parking lot, unfortunately. But, um, you know, looking at other information, whether it be business directories or the insurance maps, the Gulf Refining, Gulf Refining Company um, service station definitely had off-street pumps. Uh, Gulf 
um, built the first um, design uh, service station near Pittsburgh in 1913. You pulled off the road and you were filled up there. Um, and um, they had a similar design um, service station here in York. Um, these building permits have a lot of other information. Um, they have uh, what type of structure, wood, brick. You could do a research of how many people built um, standalone garages by their houses. Just a lot of good information there. Um, and just at the bottom, I just wanted to mention really briefly uh, the, the tremendous increase in investment in the city right after World War I ended. 1918, only 184,000 um, requested in permits. 1919, over $663,000. And just uh, things just exploded after the war was over. So to answer my question, which was the first driving um, service station? Um, I looked for the grand opening ads of the newspapers, in the newspapers. In January 15, 1920, the Golf Refining Company opened up there at Market Street and West. And you might not be able to see this well in this on the slide, but they, they definitely had um, drive-through pumps. Um, the closest I could find to a grand opening ad for National Independent Oil Company was this help wanted ad for a middle-aged man. Uh, and uh, that was in June of 1920. But I, to date, I really haven't found any evidence that uh, they had any um, off-street pumps. And then August 3rd, 1921 is the grand opening ad for the Lincoln Highway garage that we all know and love. And unfortunately from this, you know, it looks like that they, they weren't the first in New York City. And I think that was indicative of uh, Lincoln Highway garage's success over the years. Uh, you know, maybe they saw the gas station down the golf station down the street, and that's what gave them uh, the impetus to uh, put their pumps in. Um, over time, they did different things. They sold automobiles. They had um, sporting goods. They had a restaurant. You know, they did everything there, and I think uh, that's why we remember them and uh, love them so much. Just very briefly, the Lincoln Highway also brought entertainment along the way. Um, Playland was a swimming pool, miniature golf, roller rink that many people remember. It's gone, but um, you know we still have um, a roller skating rink in West York, uh, Mr. Q's Family Skate Center. We still have Lincoln Way swimming pool. Um, East, we still have uh, Jim Max ice cream uh, that has a miniature golf. Um, right next to that is East Lincoln Lanes bowling. Right next to that is an ad for the Lincoln Drive-In Theater. If you're east of York, you probably remember Stony Brook more. Uh, but again, all these venues, if, if you're driving along a historic road and you start seeing these types of family entertainment venues, you know, that is indicative of that you were driving along a historic road. Um, along the Lincoln Highway were, were many places to eat and drink. The top is a, a picture, an early postcard of the York Diner, which was um, there um, by Playland. Um, it was open 24 hours a day because of the traffic. And at the time, again, that Market Street is US 30. Right below that is a neon sign from the former Lee's Diner. And again, you see neon, um, you're on a historic road like the Lincoln Highway. And, um, you know, Lee's Diner was uh, opened in uh, the early 1950s. And, uh, currently is closed and for sale, but um, um, 
I am working on a project right now to try to restore the neon sign. Uh, if you like more about that, let me know. And finally, um, this vintage postcard, this was interesting. And you talk about social media. This place was um, Raskeller's and it was um, meant to represent uh, a German tavern that was underneath um, you know, the town halls. And again, um, Stephen Smith has written a, a great blog about on the ceiling, the Armitel um, uh, tankard mugs that they, that they had there. And it, I just was amazed at the outpouring of comments I received on this on social media. And to me, it's kind of the, the cheer syndrome. Everybody wants to go where somebody knows their name. Uh, it was great to see uh, the feedback on that. Um, and of course, the Lincoln Highway had a series of roadside attractions, this programmatic architecture, and the Haines Shoe House could be seen from the original Lincoln Highway, uh, even though now it's more visible from, from the 30 bypass, but um, Malin Haynes, um, he built this. He uh, built a, um, you know, a harness racing track. He did everything he could to, um, you know, celebrate uh, the community. And um, a lot of that was along the Lincoln Highway. The Haynes Shoe House is privately owned. First day of springs, it, it will reopen. And I would encourage you to take a tour if you have not done so and support this um, historic business. Lincoln Highway also means road trips. This is a picture from July 6, 1915. And these group, group of uh, motorcycle riders are on, on very early Harley Davidsons. The driver on the right is, um, has a pendant that says York on it. These are members of um, York Motorcycle Club that took a trip over to Devil's Den on the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And they traveled there and home again on the Lincoln Highway. Lincoln Highway was not only a uh, memorial to President Lincoln, but it was also um, known as a road of remembrance on the right is a more recent scene where people were replanting memorial trees along the Susquehanna Trail um, to honor veterans. Even before that initial planting of those memorial trees, there were trees planted all along the Lincoln Highway. Um, and it was known as a road of remembrance in honor of the sons and daughters who served in the World War, World War I. And this didn't just happen in your county, but across the nation, people planted these memorial trees. Unfortunately, in York right now, over the years, they widened the Lincoln Highway and um, trees, trees are no longer there, um, but uh, there are still the monuments uh, in both uh, Wrightsville and then and the west side near Abbottstown that mark um, this road of remembrance along the Lincoln Highway. Just wanted to finish up here quickly. Um, things you can do, you could join the National Lincoln Highway Association. If you do, you automatically become a member of the Pennsylvania chapter. Probably most importantly is to explore the highway and support the local family-owned small businesses. Uh, this pandemic has been very challenging for so many people and um, they need our support. You can visit um, what's known as the Lincoln Highway Experience near Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And that is um, provided through the Lincoln Highway Heritage Corridor. Um, they have exhibits all along the highway from, from Abbottstown to Greensburg, 
all the way across the state. Uh, and uh, you can find out more about them at the website listed here. And then our own uh, heritage area, the Susquehanna National Heritage Area, um, are doing, they're doing a lot currently with um, uh, the Underground Railroad and its, its connection with um, the transportation networks, which included certainly the road that became the Lincoln Highway. Finally, I just wanted to mention a couple initiatives I'm working on right now. I mentioned earlier, we're going to be putting up these Lincoln Highway signs across your county. I'm working on that. And we'll also be launching uh, very shortly um, our own website to uh, promote our local Lincoln Highway history. Um, the last thing I'll mention is how can we reuse some of these Lincoln Highway era uh, buildings? Probably the one that's at risk right now the most, uh, it's currently for sale in a um, challenging environment with the pandemic is uh, the former Lee's Diner um, is currently vacant and, and not operating. The former owner passed away last year and the property is currently for sale. Um, what could the modern air motel be? Uh, how can we preserve this streamline architecture and at the same time um, reboot it uh, to, um, to something new, something that can be uh, profitable, something that uh, will serve the community. And uh, just uh, something to think about. Sometimes these buildings are hiding behind um, other facades, the own, you know, our own York County History Center. If you look uh, around the lobby and to the left of the entrance to the room we normally meet, it'll talk about the fact that it used to be an automobile dealer showroom that was a, a beautiful Art Deco um, building that uh, currently is covered with a, a brick colonial facade. So many of these um, Lincoln Highway era buildings are there, but they're hidden uh, for us to find. Um, just to conclude, this is kind of a, a interesting question is, but this is the uh, centennial of what was known as the Lincoln Highway Jubilee when they um, completed paving the road from Gettysburg to Chambersburg in concrete, the Lincoln Highway. Um, they had a transportation pageant and one of the 70s scenes was this um, ox cart and who was it owned by but our very own um, Maylon Haynes owned this ox cart that was in this parade. So um, as you travel along Lincoln Highway across Pennsylvania, I'll just say please don't just uh, assume if you're on US 30 you're on the Lincoln Highway. Stop in all the towns along the way, and um, there's just some amazing things to see, especially between here and uh, Bedford, Pennsylvania. So thank you very much, and um, appreciate everybody's time. And again, I don't think I would have uh, tried to uh, publish anything if it wasn't for the writers' roundtable. And I thank you for for this opportunity. Tom, what an intriguing presentation. Um, I learned so much about the Lincoln Highway. And I think what I found so interesting is that it is, um, it's living history. You know, you go along it and you can, you can see the time period and how it's changed. So you might be able to find something that's, you know, close to hundred years old, but then how buildings are being built, you know, every year. And so here we have a great, um, the complex layer of how the Lincoln Highway has changed over time. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, so we have, thank you so much for everyone who is typing in the comments. Um, I agree, it was a super informative talk. Um, one of the questions I had, and feel free to post questions there, um, but a question I have, the Brookleaf Love Nest. I, 
that would be a phenomenal Airbnb. It's not around anymore, I'm guessing, right? Correct. It burnt down, actually. Um, but, you know, you think about it today, we have, um, you know, uh, tree houses that people want to stay in. We have tiny houses that kind of represent the cabins. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, whether they're camping in tents or in, um, you know, trailers, um, there's, there's a lot of renewed interest in uh, the unique and unusual places to stay. Um, at one point, the Haynes Shoe House, um, uh, retired couples could go there for vacation. Then newlyweds could stay there. So, you know, it was, it was special to find these places along the road and, um, you know, people made them that way so that people would, you know, want to stop and stay there. You know, I think in New Jersey, Lucy the Elephant, that's, that's you know, there, the building shaped like an elephant. They had some things where you could enter a contest to stay there overnight, you know, that type of thing. We need to bring that back. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> Um, Nicole, did we have any uh, questions on Facebook? Um, yeah, we did have a couple questions. A lot of great comments, Tom. Um, one question was, where was Playland located? Okay. Um, it was in East York, um, along, you know, along Market Street. Um, I'm just trying to go by memory here because I don't have it written down, but, you know, I think it's, it's out there, you know, like where, um, you know, the different strip malls are out there, you know, in East York and it, it may have been for some reason I'm thinking it, it um, let me just stop there and say it was in East York, but, you know, it, it's um, burnt down also and, uh, you know, now has been replaced, but uh, maybe someone on, on this call can give me a, a, a more exact location, but it's kind of slipping my mind right now. There, there was a comment, Tom, that they thought it would may, might have been near the Arby's. Um, That's what I was thinking, but I'll, I'll agree I with that. And I'll, um, go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I was I was going to say Stephen H. Smith has pointed out that um, it was in the vicinity of Wendy's uh, because uh, you know on the south side of uh, of Lincoln uh, the, and the steps up to that area are still there, uh, so you can actually see how they used to get up into that that area from the parking lot. Thank you. That's great. Um, we did have another question about um, the, the question was when when were the federal number or federal highways when was the numbering system developed for federal highways? Sure um, that would have been um, that would have been in the early 20s you know we had all of these named trails that uh, were set up because um, you know, so people could find their way along the road. And then uh, the, the roads were, uh, a lot of the roads were um, taken over by the state highway departments. So for example, across Pennsylvania, um, what became US 30 as part of the federal highway system is, uh, was initially called PA Route 1 because it was the most important road. So, you know, you get into the early 20s, then we, you know, the federal government um, took over the roads and they found all the trail names very confusing, you know, all the different markings, the things, you know, we love like, um, you know, the Lincoln Highway, red, white, and blue L. Uh, they wanted things being more uniform. And uh, so, you know, they followed some of the states that had a numbering system to develop a federal, um, 
you know, a federal uh, marking system for for the uh, interstate highways. You know, the goal was to make it simpler. Um, and, um, you know, that stuck with us for a long time, even though along the, even the interstate systems, you know, you'll see all different kinds of signs. You know, this is the Veterans Memorial Highway or the Blue Star uh, Highway, or, you know, whatever, whatever the name of, of the road or bridge may be, um, you know, we still seem to have um, desires to give our roads names beyond the numbers. We have so many interesting comments. I'm not sure how many we'll have time for. Um, uh, someone did ask where, who, well, hang on, who decided on the name Lincoln Highway? Right. Um, initially, there was a group that were going to call it the Rock to Rock Coast Highway. Mm -hmm. And again, um, their thought was, you know, a rock road is a good road. And as time went on, there was actually a proposal to build what was called a Lincoln Memorial Highway from DC to Gettysburg. You know, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of discussion of how can we properly honor Abraham Lincoln. Um, and there was that proposal. And this group decided that naming the road after President Abraham Lincoln would be a, a fitting na national memorial to the president, that it would be um, a way to, as people traveled along that road, they would be reminded that we were all united together, east to west, uh, even though, you know, the terrain is very varied, the states are very different, but we'd all be on the same road, you know, traveling together from coast to coast. And um, so um, certainly I think uh, the goal was, um, you know, to um, show that this, this coast to coast highway was a worthy memorial to Abraham Lincoln. Um, Jim, do, do we have time for more questions or um, should we wrap it up? Uh, we, we should wrap up. Okay. I can, I'm going to put my email in the chat box. If anyone has any more questions for Tom, you're welcome to email them to me and I'll make sure he gets them. Thanks again, Tom. Phenomenal presentation. So glad you can make it with us tonight and same with everybody who was able to attend from home. Uh, our next session will be in June. It'll be the first Thursday in June. We will have Delma Rivera talk to us about Latino history. And then Dominish, um, the young woman who spoke to us early about Newbury Town, she will be our presenter in September. Um, and she's gonna talk about all her local history efforts. So thank you everyone. Fabulous night again. And I'm really happy that we can continue this even in the midst of a pandemic at home and Zoom. So making it work. And thank you, Nicole, for facilitating with your County History Center. We're always very appreciative. Thank you, everyone.